It's April 3rd, 2019. I am interviewing Dr. Richard S. Dutton at the Gilbert School in Winstead, Connecticut. The interviewer is Sierra Church, a student of the Gilbert School. Also present is the camera operator, Connor Marchand. He is also a student at the Gilbert School. Please state your full name, date of birth, and the city and state in which you live. Uh, Richard S. Dutton, D-U-T-T-O-N, M-D. Your date of birth? January 22nd, 1938. In the city and state in which you live? Winstead, Connecticut. And in which war, war did you serve? I, I served from 1956 to 1970 and had some time in Vietnam during that period. And what was your branch of service? Army. What was your highest rank? Major. In what general locations did you serve? Uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, followed by the remainder of my active duty time in Vietnam. Were you drafted or did you enlist? Drafted. Where were you living at the time? Wakefield, Massachusetts. Do you recall the date? Somewhere close to January 22nd. How uh, did it, oh, I'm sorry, go excuse ahead. Excuse me, 1956. Oh, and how did you feel? Unhappy. Um, <clears throat> did you go to boot camp? Uh, technically, yes. And you were a combat surgeon, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you get to choose to be a surgeon, or did they just? I was a sur surgeon when I went on active duty. And do you recall what your first day of boot camp was like? Uh, I Technical? did. I did. Yeah. The preliminary part of being in military service about eight months after I started on active duty, and I was at Fort uh, Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, and there were probably 40, 50 doctors wow. uh, in that group, and none of us knew anything about the military. Did you have to be trained as a soldier as well? I had. Uh, about a month at Fort Sam, uh, learning to be a soldier, eight months after I started. <laughs> Where did you go after um, Sam? Uh, back to Fort Devens, and then overseas in the, in the summer uh, before going to Vietnam. What were your first impressions when you arrived to your new locations? Um, ignorance. <laughs> what were your assignments there? Uh, where? Um, in Fort Devens and Vietnam. I finished my surgical training in the summer of 1968. I was at Yale at that time and went on active duty um, early July of 1968 and went immediately to Fort Devens where they were in need of a surgeon. I was in the operating room with patients the next day, having no idea about wearing uniforms or saluting or, and that went on f until January or February of 69. What was a typical day like for you? When I first started, it was a uh, hospital clinics, hospital rounds, operating room surgery, uh, much as I'd been doing for the last previous 10 years. <clears throat> How many patients do you think you had to treat on a daily basis? Again, at, at Fort Devens? Yes. Probably saw 20 or 30. What types of situations were they in? Like, what types of wounds did you have to treat? Uh, at that time, Fort Devens functioned mostly with uh, Vietnam vets returning from active duty. Uh, we were dealing all with 
combat veterans from Vietnam, or almost all. Uh, the occasional incidental appendectomy or local disease, but mostly military veterans. Uh, my business was looking at their wounds, making sure that all was in order, sometimes reoperating on them if they needed more done, taking care of them on a day to day basis until they were discharged. And did you usually have enough supplies for these procedures? Uh, yes. Are there any specific patients or soldiers that stand out to you? No. Did you ever see combat? I saw a whole lot of it, <laughs> mostly watching uh, from the air. Uh, I will tell you more about this later, but the only time I was actually close to combat was returning from a MEDCAP visit in Vietnam by helicopter uh, crossing unsecured territory and uh, listened to a machine gun on the ground looking for the noise of the helicopter. I could see tracer bullets and that was as close as I got. They didn't hit it. That's good. <clears throat> um, were there any casualties in your unit? In my medical unit? Yes. No. And did you ever sustain any injuries yourself? No. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Uh, I received a, a bronze star at the time of my discharge from active duty. And this was primarily for the work which I did outside the hospital work in Vietnam. I'll tell you more about that later. Okay. Um, how did being a combat surgeon compare to, your, to being a doctor in Winstead? A little more active. <laughs> wasn't shot, shot at very often in Winstead. Yeah. <clears throat> How did you stay in touch with your family? U.S. mail. A rare telephone call. Did you ever go on leave? Um, from Fort Devens, I actually had a home not far away and I was home nights and weekends when I was not on call. Uh, from Vietnam, I had a R and R, which I chose to take back in Hawaii, and my wife met me there for five days. Nice. I was also managed to scrounge five days of leave, and did the same thing. <laughs> was there anything special that you did for good luck? No. Did you keep a journal? No. What was the food like for you? Adequate. <laughs> How did people entertain themselves? Where? In Fort Devens, what did you guys do to keep yourselves occupied? Well, it was a full day medically, and since I had a home and a family close by, I would finish up and, and go home um, when my, if I was not on call. And I'm trying to figure out the term. Um, if you want to go into how the Vietnam experience was for you now, you uh, could just it would help me if I could start at the beginning of my military career, oh, and I'll get you to Vietnam. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Wakefield, Massachusetts, a small town, 20 miles north of Boston. My father was a family physician, and just as a matter of fact, he had been in practice in Wakefield uh, in 1941, uh, about a month after Pearl Harbor. He volunteered for the service, went to Southeast Asia, and was stationed as a physician uh, in Australia, New Guinea, the Philippines. Uh, didn't quite make it to Japan, but was, he was away from home for four years. That was my background. I was very much familiar what military medicine was before I got nailed. Uh, at that time, uh, the draft was in effect, and I think you students ought to be very fortunate you don't live with that. But basically, as of your 18th birthday, you're eligible 
uh, for the draft. I was in my first year of college and regist registered for the draft and was immediately placed on um, reserve duty. Uh, no rank, no location, no uniform. I was just on paper as in, in the military. And I was left on reserve throughout my medical training. The military was very happy to keep on deferring me uh, as long as I was in training and could be of more value to them at the other end. This was all peacetime. And we, we fast forward through four years in college, four years in medical school, and then to Yale, Yale New Haven Hospital, and I did five years of a surgical training program there. At the end of that time, I was considering just what I was going to do next, and I had done the initial paperwork to go to Montreal and take some additional training in pediatric surgery. Uh, about a week after I let the military know that was my plan, they called me back and said, no, we have different plans for you. And they sent me to Fort Devens, which is not very far away, uh, on active duty. And initially, I was to be uh, there for a year or possibly two years doing what I already told you about. Uh, three or four months along, uh, I was received orders that I was going to go to Vietnam um, for a beginning later in, in 60, 67, 68. Uh, I was delayed actually going and finally went to Vietnam in July or early August of uh, 1969. So I was there after the peak of combat in Vietnam, but still active, active fighting going on, still casualties being generated. But at that time, the government was committed to getting us out. But I got caught right at the end of it and put in, put in a year, or just about a year, in Vietnam. So the, the point of interest is that most of my 14, 15 years in the military were on completely inactive reserve uh, courtesy of the draft. My high school classmates who were registering for the draft at the same time as I did with a two-year obligation, many of them went on active duty at that time. And they were stationed in the Army uh, at be in beginning ranks and did their two years and got out. That was peacetime in the United States. Uh, I managed to put it all off until I was trained and certified as a surgeon, but happened to, when that finished, uh, to have a war on uh, Vietnam. So I, I hadn't planned on that all the way through us. I assumed I would not go overseas. By that time, I was married with five children. So that's, that's the time frame between age 18 and in my early 30s before I actually went on active duty. Okay. So how did your family feel as well when you had to go on active duty? Uh, not happy. I mean, we, we had five children under six at the time I left. and. My wife suddenly found herself without a partner. Uh, that was not, not a good thing for the family, but they did marvelously well. Okay. Probably got out of it better than I did. How did you stay in touch with your family when you were in Vietnam? Um, a, da a daily letter, and once in a, maybe once a month, they had a 
uh, long distance phone line, and I spoke with her on the phone three or four times. Um, I w had the opportunity to travel in Asia during the year over there, and I uh, was in Tokyo several times and could call and talk with her on the phone at that time. Did they ever send you letters as well? Every day. <laughs> and did you feel stressed or pressure when you were in Vietnam? Certainly. Was there anything you did to cope with it? Uh, no. Did you keep a journal when you were in Vietnam either? No. no? We have all the letters. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and what was it like performing these procedures in Vietnam? It was something I'd been doing for many, many years, so I was pretty comfortable with it. By the time I went, I was completely trained as a general surgeon. I had taken my certification exams and passed, so I was board certified, and the Army recognized this by promoting me um, up to a major, which was better pay and a, a little more uh, comfort in the field. The average doctor who went to Vietnam, I presume always, but particularly at that time, would land in uh, Long Bin, just north of Saigon, and there was a military distribution center, and you'd be sent either somewhere in country or uh, to one of the major hospitals in the area. With my level of training, they wanted me in a hospital. The average physician who might have gone in with less training, younger, less experienced, might be in the field, uh, for his first six months before he got into a hospital. Um, he would at that time have res responsibility for a, a unit of American military and keep track of their daily health and their needs, but was also uh, called into combat whenever it was necessary. And there, was, there were deaths in that group. I was delighted not to be in the field. I was at the 93rd of Ack Hospital uh, for my whole time there and uh, worked as a, as, a, as a surgeon without ever having to, to go out in the field. And what was your daily routine like in Vietnam? Um, up, run, eat, make rounds on inpatients. Uh, making sure everybody was well settled for the day, go to the operating room for scheduled and sometimes unscheduled surgery, which would usually keep me busy well into the afternoon. Uh, I was in a hospital with six or seven surgeons. Our system was you were on call every third day, which means on day one, uh, you'd get primary responsibility for any new casualties coming in, uh, and they were yours throughout their hospitalization time. Uh, day, day two, you would only do what the overflow from what day one uh, had. Day three, you were not on call and were at liberty to move around unless we got busy. I was there for the second of the Vietnamese Tet Offensives, and we had patients coming in 36 hours straight. You worked for 36 hours straight before you could slow down. Did what you had to do. Yeah. How many soldiers do you think you usually got on day one? I've had 20 or 30. That, that's enough for one person. And the next man on call picks up so that nobody gets ne neglected and what were the types of wounds that you most commonly saw? Probably the most common thing is something we call MFW, multiple frag wounds, 
picture a mortar round, and it's full of the equivalent of nuts and bolts, pieces of metal, rocks, uh, and when it lands, it explodes, and all these fragments, uh, they may injure anybody nearby, so that one mortar round might injure 40 or 50 people. Uh, there were also uh, mines, and in many areas you had to be extremely careful where you went, because if you stepped on a mine, uh, it explodes. And, uh, many, many casualties with loss of both legs or both legs and an arm. And did you have enough supplies at the hospitals in Vietnam? Remarkably, yes. The, the key issue was the blood bank, and we were very well supplied with blood for transfusion, and that made a huge difference in how many of these guys survived. Being able to transfuse them immediately was helpful. Uh, one story, they ran out of rubber gloves, and I operated for the better part of a week without gloves. No greater infection, much better sense of feel, but uh, not the best thing in the world. Yeah. Are there any specific patients or soldiers that stand out to you? Well, my last patient in Vietnam, knowing I was going to be leaving soon, uh, was a young soldier who had uh, gotten frag wounds in his right elbow and you look at his x-ray and it's it's full of metal. Uh, bones broken, nerves damaged, blood vessels damaged, and he came in and uh, got cleaned up and taken to the operating room and uh, I repaired his bones and his nerves, sewed up the wound. The rest of him was unhurt. And in the course of that, asked him his name and where he was from. Uh, he lived in East Canaan. And uh, he gave me the name of his parents. And within a day or two, I was back to Connecticut. And I had the pleasure or not pleasure of calling that family and saying, your, your son has been hurt. He's alive and well and he will be home in time. And I've kept up with those people since then. He was the postmaster in Canaan for many years. I've been to his family weddings and got to, got to know the family pretty well. Are there any other relationships that you've maintained? Uh, I worked for eight or nine months with a surgeon who is now in practice or was in Seattle, uh, trained at the University of Washington, uh, one of the finest surgeons I've ever worked with, and we've kept up. I had close friends who were not surgeons, and we exchanged emails and Christmas cards, uh, a couple in New York, New York City. How did your time as a surgeon in Vietnam compare to Winstead as well? A little busier. Do you think your experience in the military helped your civilian and surgeon life here? Yes, very much so. Yeah. From a surgical perspective, the more you do, the more comfortable you get. Where were you? What did you think of, the, of, of your fellow surgeons? most excellent, occasional less than excellent. Uh, there were people that you knew needed uh, supervision and attention, and, and I would function as a teacher uh, with them, but for, for the most part, they're excellent surgeons. <clears throat> and did you go back to school after your time in Vietnam, or back just right back to work? I, well, remember when I was over there, I had finished my training. Mm -hmm. I had very tentative plans, but nothing f fixed. 
to take an additional year uh, specializing or subspecializing in pediatric surgery. I didn't do that. I was blessed with the opportunity to join a surgeon who had trained with me at Yale in uh, private practice here in Winstead. And within a week after getting back from Vietnam, I was working in his office and at the Winstead Hospital. Where were you when your service ended? I finished in Vietnam. I was home and uh, then had to go to Long Island to a military post to be actively discharged. My commitment was for two years, and the military honored that uh, to the day. So tell me more about that day and being discharged. How were you feeling? Uh, very pleased. Very happy to have done the year overseas. Uh, obviously very happy to get back to my family and start a usual life. <clears throat> what was your homecoming like? Uh, much, much pleasure. <clears throat> what did you do during the days and weeks following your discharge? Went to work as a, as a surgeon here in the community. My wife had bought a house up on Platte Hill here in Winstead and we're still living there. Um, kids were in school for that year here, here in Winstead. And been pretty comfortable since then. Oh, I think. went. I went over my actual time in in Vietnam. I've told you the work schedule of a whole lot one day, less the next day, and pretty free of responsibilities on the third day. I volunteered rather than sit around the hospital uh, to join a military police unit, probably about 40 minutes helicopter flying time from the hospital. And I ran some clinics uh, for the Vietnamese people. The, the motto at that time was to win the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, there were no doctors uh, available to these Vietnamese people. And I, I did what I could out of a big box of supplies uh, in terms of trying to make a diagnosis, treating simple things. And I did this many times. Our practice at the 93rd of AC was to take the soldiers coming in and out of combat, stabilize them, operate on them, do whatever had to be done, and then within three to four days, they would move on out of Vietnam. They were, if they were deemed able to go back on active duty within 30 days, they would go, would go to Vang Tau, which is a, a seaside town and not far from Saigon, spend their 30 days on the beach, and then go back to their unit and go back to fighting fighting the war. Uh, those that were not well enough to do that, say broken bones that were not going to be functionally healed in weeks to months, they would be transferred to sometimes to Japan, sometimes to the Philippines, sometimes to Okinawa, and then when they're further stabilized back home to places like Fort Devens to complete their recovery. If we had a very badly injured or very sick patient who uh, could not safely travel within that time frame, uh, they would send a doctor one-on-one um, -on -one with that patient. And I took several trips from Vietnam to Japan, and my task was to keep them alive and unhurt and get them into a hospital in Japan uh, where they would stay until they'd recovered further. Uh, 
I had written orders for these trips, and they would always read next available flight back to Vietnam, and we interpreted that as two days before we could find the flight and go back to the war. And I had the opportunity to travel a little bit in, J in Japan and see Tokyo, and the World's Fair happened to be going that time, so I went to the World's Fair. Uh, that was sort of a unique uh, experience. Not, not everybody got to do that. Back to when you said you had to work out of a big box of supplies, did you ever run out or have to improvise for any of those situations? Im improvising all the way. Remember that we were surrounded by a military, military police company, 30 or 40 of them, to be sure that there was no trouble. And we saw children and old folks in the village. Uh, I had antibiotics, bandages, uh, as a surgeon, couldn't do much, but uh, did the best we could out of the box of supplies. <laughs> and did any of your kids end up in the military? Uh, my oldest son was an anesthesiologist. He went on active duty near the end of his training, was at, I can't do it, top of my head, but one of the big uh, naval hospitals in Washington, D.C. He was in the Navy. He did f four years of active duty as an anesthesiologist there. <coughs> Never went on a boat. <laughs> was in the Navy the whole time. Um, he's the only one that's been in the military. The younger kids have not been. <coughs> How did your military experience affect your thoughts on war and the military in general? To be avoided at all costs. So did you support your children's decision to join the Navy? As, as a matter of fact, he came home to tell me that because I had been paying his tuition and expenses through medical school. And he came in one day and said, oh, by the way, I've joined the Navy. So the Navy did his next four years of expenses and tuitions. I was grateful for that. Did you join any veteran organizations? I'm a member of the VFW here in town, post 296, I think. I've been in the building once. I felt that I ought to join, but I was not going to spend my time at the bar. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you attend? <clears throat> Do you attend any reunions? Have not. Yeah, you can ask me that. Is there anything you would like to add that has not been covered in this interview? Um, no, I, I had the chance to talk about what the draft meant to high school kids in the 50s and 60s, and you people should be very pleased that you don't have to cope with that in your, your life plans. Uh, my passageway from beginning in the military at the age of 18, but yet really not going on active duty to, for 10 or 15 more years is most unusual. Most of my high school classmates were on active duty in peacetime, uh, but it interrupted their lives uh, back in the 50s and 60s. I'd like to thank you for your service and also for taking the time to be interviewed today. Thank you for your time.